Happy, Happy spring, spring everyone. everyone! We are here on the first night of spring at the Great Swamp Wildlife Management Area, and we are standing in a vernal pool. Ta-da! A vernal pool is essentially a puddle in the middle of the woods that fills uh, seasonally with rainwater, with melted snow, uh, with groundwater, and a vernal pool is called a vernal pool because vernal means spring. So it's filled up in the spring and then by the midsummer, it's completely dry. A lot of different animals use vernal pools. So things like turtles and wood ducks will definitely use vernal pools. But tonight, we're actually looking for amphibians. So things like wood frogs and spotted salamanders. And hopefully we'll hear some spring peepers too. I can hear some in the distance right now, but maybe there'll be some calling here in just a few minutes. So let's take a walk in a vernal pool. Here we go. So we've got here whoa, some spotted salamander egg masses. Uh, so you can see that they're kind of cloudy looking and they look like they're in a little Ziploc bag. That's kind of the way that I remember it. It's that spotted salamanders, when they lay their eggs, they put them in a little Ziploc bag and it looks like a bunch of grapes that's in there. So we found some wood frog eggs and I'm gonna gently, gently lift them up so we don't disturb them. And you can see in my hands, so see how those are like little bunch of grapes, no Ziploc bag envelope, and they're laid in a giant cluster. Um, so there's quite a few of them here. And what wood frogs will do, the females will all lay their eggs kind of in the same place. And that helps to conserve heat so that the eggs will kind of incubate together. And they'll also pick the sunniest side of the vernal pool so that they can absorb as much heat as possible. Because this water, my hand is in the water right now, and it is very, very cold still. Um, so these eggs need to get as much warmth as they can so that they can develop and hatch as quickly as possible. wood frog here in my net. I'm not going to touch this frog right now because my hands are really dry. If I was going to pick him up, I would want to wet my hands first. So I'll put him down here so you can get a better look at him. So wood frogs are the ones that you'll hear going cluck, 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 cluck uh, from the vernal pools. They don't rip it uh, like a regular frog. They almost sound like ducks. And actually, all frogs make different sounds. So when you say a frog goes ribbit ribbit, it's actually not true. There's really not a frog that goes ribbit ribbit. The closest one would probably be the bullfrog. That sounds kind of like the typical frog and he goes juggerum, juggerum. You can see that black mask of the wood frog and then that white lip right below it. And I think this one is probably a female because she's got very small front arms the males would have really strong ones that look almost like mussels. And wood frogs, they'll use the vernal pools in the spring, but for the rest of the year, they spend their entire life in the forest surrounding the vernal pools. So it's very important to conserve the pools themselves, but also the surrounding habitat. And these guys have a really cool adaptation that they can actually freeze solid. They turn into little frogsicles. Uh, peepers do this as well, and so do gray tree frogs which we won't hear until the summer. And that adaptation freezes their limbs, their toes, their extremities first, and then their body pumps a bunch of sugar into their heart and their liver. So that sugar actually makes the melting point of those organs a lot lower than the rest of their body. So that means that if the temperatures go down to freezing in the winter, the frog freezes, so all of its extremities freeze, and then the last thing to freeze is its heart and its liver. If the temperature raises up just a little bit, the heart and the liver will actually unfreeze, start to function, and then the rest of the frog will still be frozen, which is crazy. So the frog actually, the heart stops beating, the whole body shuts down, and they go into a state of torpor, 
uh, which is kind of like hibernation. And then if it gets just slightly warm enough, the heart unfreezes and starts to pump to keep the frog alive, but the rest of the frog will be frozen. And these guys, they'll hide themselves underneath logs and little burrows, sometimes just underneath the leaf litter, under like a little blanket of leaves for the winter, and that's about it. Other frog species like bullfrogs will spend their time in the winter underneath the water, uh, underneath the ice in a pond, and that actually insulates them uh, to a degree uh, that, they, that they don't need to do this type of freeze tolerance uh, adaptation. I found another, another wood frog egg mass. So these are probably, oh, there's a peeper. There's a peeper. Oh, where is that peeper? So this peeper is literally like two feet away from us. And we cannot find him. And we cannot see him. him. So he's like somewhere in here. Tell me if you do find him. Anybody see him? Because I don't. <laughs> Peepers so, are re really, really tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny. And they're just about impossible to find when you're trying to find them in a vernal pool or really anywhere. Yeah, so they are only about, oh, there he is, an inch and a half long. Um, they like to hide amongst grasses like this and they actually have sticky toes so they can climb up on top of these grasses and hold on. Peepers are very loud for their size. Uh, they're probably our loudest frog that we have in Rhode Island and the way that you know you've got a peeper, obviously it's going to be really tiny, but if you do get to see one up close, they have a little X on their back. Their scientific name is Sudacris crucifer. So crucifer meaning the cross. They've got a little cross on their back. Oh, oops, I just heard a little. All right, so I actually just found, as we were looking for that peeper, a little red back salamander. So these guys don't really use vernal pools like our spotted salamanders do, but they definitely will live in any kind of wet area. Um, and they like to hide underneath um, logs and any kind of leaves and debris. So this guy was taking a little dip in our vernal pool. So they can visit them, but they're not typically the ones to, whoo, to live um, or lay eggs in their vernal pool. So you can see that there are some twigs moving around at the bottom of the vernal pool. These are not twigs, these are caddisfly larvae. So caddisflies, what they do is they make themselves a little tiny sleeping bag, essentially out of twigs and rocks and sticks and all sorts of stuff. And they protect their really soft bodies. So they have these little like pinchy kind of legs at the front and then the rest of their body looks like a worm. So they construct this cool little case to protect themselves. A toad here. He is an American toad and I know he's an American toad um, for one reason just by looking at his belly. He's got kind of some spots underneath here on his belly. We also have Fowler's toads and they look very similar except for they would have a very plain belly and they like really sandy soils. We also have Spadefoot toads. But they look very very different. If you saw a Spadefoot toad um, then it would have a vertical pupil here and it would have uh, more of a smooth back. So we've got our American toad. He also has, whoo, come here little toady. He also has these little glands on his back. And these are actually poisonous to any other animal that tries to eat them. But you won't get any, um, you won't get hurt at all from a toad. So there are a lot of threats that are facing amphibians, both here in Rhode Island and throughout the world. So some of the ones that we're really concerned about are things like disease and habitat loss and pollution. Habitat loss is a huge one and one that we're trying to do something about here in Rhode Island just by protecting their habitat or the places that they live. The reason why it's so important to conserve really big chunks of habitat is because of something called fragmentation. So fragmentation is when you have a nice big chunk of habitat but then it ends up getting cut into these tiny little pieces by things like roads and houses and other types of development. And when you do that, you're actually cutting up their habitat and making it really hard and dangerous for things like amphibians and salamanders and frogs. So if there's a frog and he's on this side of the road and he's in the woods and he needs to get to the vernal pool, but it's on the other side of the road, 
then the frog has to hop across the road, which is really, really dangerous, not only for amphibians, but lots of other animals as well. So in Rhode Island, we're trying to conserve as much habitat as possible. Another really cool way you can help is to become a citizen scientist with the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife. So we just launched our very own Herp Observer app, and this free app allows you to submit observations of reptiles and amphibians from anywhere that you are. Uh, you just take a photo and it sends it uh, all of the information to our herpetologist, so that's our biologist who studies reptiles and amphibians. And that information goes right into our database, and we're able to use it to study reptiles and amphibians in Rhode Island and also to figure out where these animals are across the state because all of that data is really, really important to us. Are we ready? Tapi.